So today's lecture is coming to you from my home here in Hanover, Maryland, near Baltimore. And it's on the work of 20th century American political philosopher John Rawls. And as you'll see, we're going to look at Rawls' original position argument, his intuitive argument. And then I have a couple of discussion questions for you. On the set here today is my lovely daughter, Emily. Say hi, Emily. <laughs> my handsome son, Justin. Say hi, Justin. Hi. Justin. And a host of characters are going to help us explain Rawls's political philosophy. So first of all, the original position argument. Rawls argued, and, and many people agree, that there's a problem when real people do political philosophy. And the problem is, Emily, Emily, shh, Emily, please shh, put that back in there. I'm using that for the lecture. Thank you. There's a problem when you use real people to discuss political philosophy, and the problem is they often promote their own interests. So, for example, if we were going to ask Minnie Mouse and Sock Monkey and Christmas Bear and Raggedy Ann and Horsey and Curious George what they thought the state should provide and what level of taxation the people should be subjected to, they would allow their personal biases and interests to enter into the equation. So, for example, Minnie Mouse lives at uh, Disney World. And I assume that she lives a pretty luxurious life there. And so she would probably say we shouldn't have any taxation at all. And we don't need any government programs because, hey, I'm doing just fine at Disneyland. Sock Monkey, on the other hand, lives in a sock drawer. And so he probably would prefer some government programs to give him some education or give him a chance to get out of the sock drawer. Crispus Bear lives at the North Pole with Santa Claus. And so he has a great time up there. And he doesn't uh, need any government programs or benefits, so he would probably argue against taxation. Raggedy Ann is homeless and starving, and so she would argue uh, very vehemently for government programs and such. Um, Horsey, I guess, lives in a barn and probably doesn't like that. And Curious George lives with the man in the yellow hat. And he has a pretty good life, but he's somewhere in between the extremes of Raggedy Ann and Minnie Mouse. But the point here is that if we ask these individuals, these particular characters what they think about political philosophy, what the state should provide, and, and what level of taxation the public should be should, subjected to. They're going to allow their personal biases to confuse or to cloud or to at least influence their answers. And so politics becomes a game of trying to get the most for yourself or trying to promote what's best for you and not necessarily what's objective justice, not necessarily what's all things considered the most ethical solution, most ethical policy. Rawls came up with an ingenious thought experiment to get past that. And he said, well, what if we could prevent people from knowing things about themselves that would cloud their judgment in this way? What if we could put them behind what he calls a veil of ignorance, a veil of ignorance that would prevent them from knowing anything at all about their wealth or their income or the social status, their job, whether they're Bill Gates or a homeless person, whether they're a professional athlete or a professor, whether they have wonderful health insurance or no health insurance, whether they're going to a private school or a really crummy public school, their religious convictions, all those things, their, their gender, their sexual orientation, going to block them from knowing all those different things about themselves. And the veil of ignorance here is <laughs> represented <laughs> by a Powerpuff Girls blanket. Is it Powerpuff or Powderpuff? Your blanket? I think. No, no, but I don't know. Blanket. It's your blanket, Emily? Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. But mom. No. All right. Whoever's blanket it is, it's blocking these animals and these characters from knowing anything at all about themselves that would influence their political judgment. And so now, behind this veil of ignorance, preventing them from knowing anything about themselves that would cloud their judgment, now we're going to ask them what sort of a political regime would you endorse? And let's ask them first would you endorse utilitarianism? Well, Rawl says. Obviously, no, they would reject utilitarianism for reasons we've already considered earlier in the, uh, the class, namely because it would leave people subject to the whim of the majority. And so perhaps uh, the majority would vote to enslave blue-eyed persons and have them do all the work, or maybe it would justify throwing uh, Christians to the lines for the benefit of the crowd, etc. Utilitarianism isn't the best foundation for individual protections, and since all of these characters behind the veil of ignorance want to promote their own interests— even though they don't know what those interests are at the moment, they would have to reject utilitarianism. And so we could take that one and strike it right out, right out the gate. What about feudalism? What about a society in which you have kings and queens and knights and serfs, etc.? 
Well, Rawls thinks that they would reject this sort of society as well, which we can envision by looking at these chess pieces, a king, a knight, and a pawn. He thinks they would reject that because there's no social mobility in a feudal society. Kings are born kings. Knights are born knights. Pawns, or say the serfs, or the peasants, are born serfs and peasants. And so there's no ability for these folks to be promoted up into the ranks of knights, no ability for the knights to be promoted up to the ranks of kings. And so... Um, behind the veil of ignorance, these folks would reject that because they don't know if once the veil is lifted, they're a king or a serf or a peasant. Maybe they're a king and that would be awesome. Maybe they're a peasant and that would be really bad. And so they reject feudalism and so we can mark that off as well. Next one we'll consider is what about libertarianism? That's, that's got a benefit over feudalism in that, that, in that there's social mobility. There's the ability that if you work hard and if you have a little bit of luck, you can move yourself up the chain of social class and such. What about that? Well, Rawls says that behind the veil of ignorance, these folks would reject libertarianism as well because they don't know whether they are UT Barbie, who has her arms up in the air for a touchdown big orange, living in this nice, luxurious house, or if they're Smurfette, who typically lives in a mushroom, but today is living in a barn. Or if you're somewhere in between and just these little people over here who live in a, a decent house, but not a mansion and not a barn. And so if it's the case that you live in a barn, like Smurfette, or perhaps you're out on the street, you have the ability to work your way up the social ladder, but it's certainly not guaranteed. And in many cases, there are insurmountable obstacles or what uh, the accumulation of which can be insurmountable obstacles that have, at the very least can make this very, very difficult. And since the folks behind the veil of ignorance want to promote their own interests, there's no reason why they should accept this if there's a better alternative. And so Rawls argues that the stakes are just too high. Maybe they're going to be Bill Gates, maybe they'll be Barbie in the Barbie house, but they could be the homeless person or smart vets, so they'd reject that. Now what about something we might call strict egalitarianism? Strict egalitarianism would be a society, a society in which, regardless of your contribution to the economy, Everyone would have the exact same amount of money. They have the same amount of wealth and the same amount of income. And so here, as you can see, Pooh Bear, Hello Kitty, and Strawberry Shortcake all have two pieces of candy. Now, initially, this seems to be more attractive than libertarianism, in which you have this very extreme inequality. You would think that folks behind the veil of ignorance might endorse this. They might say, yeah, let's keep everybody equal. But what if it's the case that there's a way to arrange things such that people have more than they would under a strict egalitarian regime. What if it's the case that if we introduce certain incentives that enable people to earn more for themselves, what if it's the case that inequality is introduced into the equation such that some people have more, some people have more than others, but everyone has more than they would under strict egalitarianism, why wouldn't they prefer this? But Rawls thinks that they would have, would prefer this. And he thinks that if you prefer a society in which everyone has the exact same amount of money, regardless of contribution, well, then you're just making a fetish of equality because there's no reason to prefer economic inequality over inequality if and only if the inequality benefits everyone. And as we can see here under this, everyone has more than they would have under a strict egalitarian regime. And so folks behind the veil of ignorance would endorse this and support this and favor this over spreading the wealth completely evenly and constantly interfering in the economy to achieve that aim. Now, if it were the case that in order to achieve this sort of wealth for some, others had to do worse off, had to be worse off than they would be, kids. Under strict egalitarianism, Rawls thinks that they would reject this. And so original position agents would say, nope, this cannot work. Neither, than, not, neither can this, because in this case, Pooh Bear has one less piece of candy than they would if it were spread evenly. But so long as Pooh Bear has more candy than he would under a strict egalitarian spread, well, inequality is just fine. But it's contingent upon the betterment of the least well-off group. And therefore original position agents behind this field of ignorance would endorse it for those reasons. And so 
We have reason to reject strict egalitarianism where everything is completely equal. And what Rawls thinks the OP agents would endorse is something he calls a property-owning democracy. Now, I don't think Sandell uses that phrase, but that's what Rawls calls it, so we're going to call it that. And under a property-owning democracy, you'd have two principles of justice, the second of which is broken down into two different parts. The first principle is the liberty principle, and this guarantees the most expansive system of basic liberties compatible with a similar system for all. And so just think of the American Constitution's Bill of Rights. You've got freedom of expression, freedom of religion, freedom of the press, liberty of conscience, which just means freedom of thought, which is implicit in all those freedoms. You have equal political liberties, etc., etc. Things that enable people to pursue their conception of a good life, what they think a good life is, so long as they didn't interfere with others in a negative way, and to just go off and, and be free in that way. And so this would prevent the sorts of harms we would see under libertarianism, and, and the equal treatment would prevent the sort of institutionalized um, inequality that feudalism would incur. Now, the equal opportunity principle, which is the first part of the second principle of justice, that would ensure at the very least anti-discrimination laws that would prevent employers and other offices, political offices and such, from discriminating against people according to inherited um, features, such as their race or their sex, etc. But it would also guarantee and require a, a similar level of education or access to education, a similar level of access to basic nutrition and health care, such that everyone has a substantive equal chance to compete in the market. Because if some folks are able to go to private schools and have luxurious health care while others have to go to public schools and have absolutely no health care, there's going to be a huge disadvantage there that Rawls argues folks behind the veil of ignorance would not be willing to tolerate. And last, the difference principle. This is a principle that says that inequalities are completely fine. Inequalities in the economy, anyway, and income and wealth are completely fine. Emily. so long as they're to the betterment of the least well-off group. And so that's what we figured out over here. This was the exercise to bring about the, the difference principle. Inequalities are just fine. It's all right for some to have more than others, so long as everyone has more than they would under an equal distribution. Here's an equal distribution. So now we're going to introduce in incentives into the economy such that perhaps we pay physicians more. Maybe we allow CEOs to make more money than fry cooks. But even fry cooks have more than they would under a strict egalitarian regime. And this makes sense because if you have an economy in which you have um, incentives, financial incentives to work harder, people are going to do so and they're going to contribute more to the economy. It's going to grow, be more wealth for all. Everyone's ship will rise with that riding, rising tide. Okay, so that's the original position argument. And now we lift the veil of ignorance. And Minnie Mouse and Sock Monkey and Christmas Bear and Raggedy Ann and Horsey and Curious George now are willing to live by these two principles of justice, which would then be used to generate a new constitution, or in our case, used to interpret an existing constitution and judge existing and proposed laws. So that's one argument for the two principles of justice. Here's the other argument, and we've, we've previewed this a few times so far in the course, and it's what Rawls calls the intuitive argument and what Sandel calls the argument for moral arb arbitrariness. And borrowing here from political philosopher Will Kimlicka and also Ronald Dworkin, the point is that most of us think that success should be a function or a factor uh, of our choices and our effort and not the genetic lottery or historical accident. And so as a matter of fact, a lot of things influence our ability to succeed in the market over which we have no control and therefore have, deserve no credit. And so whether we're born into a good family a bad family, a supportive family, a destructive family, whether we're born with innate intelligence or innate mental handicaps, whether we're born into an area that has fantastic schools or terrible schools, our parents are rich and educated or poor and uneducated, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So many things play into our ability to succeed. And so if we simply tolerate this, then that's going to lead to a society in which the people who are successful in many cases, are successful not because they necessarily worked harder, made better choices than other folks, but just because they happen to be born into a good situation. And the people who aren't successful just happen to be born into a bad situation. Now, of course, there are going to be exceptions of people who are born with all, every advantage in the world. They just make terrible choices and they squander it. And we're going to have examples of people who are born into poverty and they ascend nonetheless. And these are wonderful stories. But it's going to be a diff more difficult road for the people born at the bottom and an easier 
uh, time for people born at the top. And so this seems to be an inherent unfairness that we don't have to tolerate. We can do things institutionally to uh, correct this and take, take it into account. Now, what can we do? Hey, Emily, could you do something a little bit more quiet for a little while? All right, thank you. Emily, don't play that right now. Do something else, okay? All right, thank you, sweetie. So we can, we can judge these different options, a feudal society, a libertarian society, a meritocracy, or a property-owning democracy. Under a feudal society, people are born as peasants or serfs, as royalty, or as uh, kings, knights, etc. And that's not cool because, hey, you either have a fantastic life or a crummy life. I've got marker on my finger. According to your birth. But no one has any control over whether they're born as a royal or as a commoner. And so that seems very unfair, and we should not tolerate that. Under a libertarian regime, similar sorts of structural advantages and disadvantages have a huge influence over our ability to succeed or not. It's much more fair than the feudal society because social mobility is possible, but it's still very difficult. Under a meritocracy, and here the key word, the root word is merit, I don't mean to do that. Under a meritocracy, we do things that offset the influence of historical and genetic accident. And so we would do a lot of things that the equal opportunity principle requires and ensure that people had access to a good education and basic nutrition, basic health care, etc., such that when they compete in the market, whether or not they succeed or fail is a function of their choices and their effort and not just where they happen to be born, the schools they happen to, to be able to go to. But this doesn't include something that the property-owning democracy does. There's property-owning democracy, P-O-D. And that is the difference principle, such that the success of the most well-off is contingent upon the benefit to the least well-off. And again, we figured that out by running the exercise with the candy over there and thinking through it from the perspective of the original physician agents who were behind the Powerpuff Girls Veil of Ignorance. Okay, that's my lecture on Rawls. It's the fastest I've ever given his two arguments for the two principles of justice, but I hope it worked out nonetheless. Here are your two discussion questions. Number one, evaluate the above. Two arguments, original position argument and the intuitive argument. Is it the case that original position agents behind the Veil of Ignorance would indeed endorse these two principles of justice, the second of which has two, two uh, portions? Why do you think it's the case? Why do you not think it's the case? Would they really reject all this? Does this argument make sense, etc.? Also, the intuitive argument, is it the case that a property-owning democracy, which has the difference principle, is superior to a meritocracy, which is superior to a libertarian regime, which is superior to a feudal society, because these progressively or degressively, depending on which way you look at them, either satisfy or run contrary to what we all want, and that is for success to be a function of our choices and our effort and not things that are beyond our control. Second discussion question, apply the original position argument to some political issue of your choice. I don't care what it is, whatever you think is interesting, whatever you think will be fun, apply this veil of ignorance reasoning to it. Think about the parties that are involved in the issue, think about their current positions, and then think about what position, what policy they would endorse if they didn't know who they were, if they didn't know what position they occupied. Okay, that's my lecture on Rawls. Hope you guys are having a great week. Look forward to your posts and such. Justin, say goodbye. Bye-bye. Where did Emily go? She's, I think she's downstairs. Okay, say bye for her. Bye-bye. And go Rawls. Say go Rawls. Go Rawls.